of Ruth was played out in the fields just below me, next to the city of Bethlehem. The book of Ruth is a story about provision. There was famine in the land, but God took care of his own. It's also the story of conversion. We find out how a young Moabitess turns to the God of Israel as her own Lord. But greater than that is the story of redemption. Far more than a love story, it predicts the kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ, who would also be born in the town of Bethlehem just behind me as the Savior, as the Redeemer of all mankind. So let's get into the book of Ruth as we continue in the Bible from 30,000 feet. With only four chapters, the book of Ruth is one of the shortest books in Jewish or Christian scripture. But this book is packed with deep significance. Would you open up your Bibles to the book of Ruth, chapter 1. We're going through the whole book tonight. That's really not a big deal. There's only four chapters. So given what we've done already in the Bible from 30,000 feet, covering the whole book of Deuteronomy in one night, I think we can cover the book of Ruth. Now, the book of Ruth is the only book in the Old Testament named after an ancestor of Jesus Christ. That ought to get our interest up. It's also the only book in the Old Testament named after a non-Jew, somebody who's a Gentile, as we discover Ruth is. It's also one of the only two books in the Old Testament, for that matter, in the entire Bible, named after a woman. The other is the book of Esther. Esther. That's right. Ruth and Esther have that lofty, notable privilege of being named after two wonderful, godly women. The term Ruth, the name means friendship. And she really shows her color in that area. It's a story of God's providence, how he arranges natural things to correspond with his supernatural will. And as we noted in communion, it's a story of redemption, how there is a relative, a kinsman, he is called, a goel in Hebrew, a kinsman redeemer who provides a very important redemption for a family. So... Let's begin in chapter 1, verse 1. By the way, if you wanted to give an outline to this book, you could simply give it four points by the four chapters. Chapter 1 is love's resolve. Ruth makes a resolute commitment to follow Naomi to another country and to adopt the country, the culture, but more than that, the God of the children of Israel. Love's resolve, that's chapter one. Number two, chapter two, love's response. In response to the decision, she's there in poverty, gleaning out in the fields, and she meets a man by the name of Boaz and responds to his initiation. Chapter three is love's request. Based upon the response, she now makes a request in chapter three to be redeemed, her family, and herself. In chapter 4 is love's reward. She gets redeemed, the family land goes back to the original owners, and she is wed to Boaz. So chapter 1, verse 1, it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. We notice in verse 1 it was a time of rebellion. It's the time when the judges ruled. And if you remember from our study in the book of Judges, those weren't great times. There was apostasy. There was an ungodly fervor and attitude in all of the people. And we don't exactly know when we should place the book of Ruth in in terms of the timetable of the book of Judges, but it's probably best, and most scholars do, place it around Judges chapter 10 when a guy named Yair, or as we like to say in English, Jair was the judge in that land. And when Jair was there, that's probably the time when the book of Ruth took place. So it's a a time of rebellion. It's also a time of relativism. The very last verse in the book of Judges says this, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And then finally, it was a time of retribution. God is judging the people. It says in verse 1, there was famine 
in the land. We don't know exactly why. There's a lot of reasons famines could happen. Drought, wind, hail, locusts, foreign raiders coming in and taking the crops. But whatever reason it was doesn't matter. This we know from Deuteronomy, if you remember, that the productivity of the land and the rain that would come was in direct proportion to the obedience of the people. If you obey me, you'll have a fruitful time. If you don't, you won't. So now there's a famine. It's part of the judgment. Verse 2, the name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife, Pleasant, Naomi. The names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Now, you know, probably most of you, that names were given at birth either because of the reaction of the parents to something going on in their lives or a circumstance at birth, which makes us wonder because the names of these two kids, Malon means sickly or weakling. What a horrible thing to call your son. What's his name? Sicko. Really? And the other one wasn't much better. Kilion means crybaby, <laughs> pining. Now, you know, most parents have this morbid fear of having weird kids. Like, what if my kids turns out really weird and ugly? And, and kids, when they're born, um, are interesting looking, all of them when they're born. And you sort of have to get over some things to get past some things to say, oh, how beautiful. <laughs> Looks just like you. <laughs> and I'm sure it probably wasn't that bad. This simply could be the reaction of a first-time father seeing two babies being born and not knowing what to say or what to make of it. Oh, no, look, it happened. <sighs> Sicko. Cry baby. That's the name of my boys. Now, the name of the father is most interesting. Elimelech comes from two Hebrew words Eli, which is my God, Melech, king. Eli Melech, my God is king. That's what his name means, yet he never really lived up to it. Why do I say that? Because if your God is King Elimelech, why do you need to leave the land of covenant, Israel, and go to foreign soil instead of just trusting God where you're at? And he would say, well, because there's a famine in the land. Yeah, but you're going over to a place that is a sworn enemy of the Jews, the land of Moab. Now, the land of Moab, the plains of Moab were about 3,500 feet above sea level. They got about 16 inches of rain per year. The soil is very porous, so it stays green, verdant. It was beautiful over there. You could see it uh, around Bethlehem. You could get up to a ridge, and you can see right over the Dead Sea and into the land of Moab, and it would look beautiful to him. Except it's not your land. They're enemies of the Jews. They have child sacrifice. They don't worship Yahweh. They don't worship your God. They worship a God called Chemosh. And they worshiped that God by child sacrifice. So this was a step of unbelief for him to go. But he made it under pressure. And you know what? A lot of us make bad choices under pressure. Finances aren't what they are. You take out the second mortgage, the third, the fourth, the fifth. Soon you're bankrupt. You did it under pressure. Under pressure, he moves over to the other side. Verse 3, then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Now she took wives. They took wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelt there about 10 years. Then both Melon and Kilion also died. So the women survived her two sons and her husband. Now, there's a lot of heartache compressed in these three verses. Hey, picture the scene. They move over there. They settle down into a nice four-bedroom tent, two-camel garage. They got it made. Maybe they joined the donkey lodge. I don't know what they had back then. Then one day, Naomi gets a call from Moab, 
emergency room at the local hospital saying, your husband Elimelech has just passed away. Her world ended. Now she is all alone with her two kids, her two sons, Malon and Chilion. And eventually they will die. One commentator says, he lost his life seeking his livelihood and he found a grave where he sought a home. Remember Jesus said, whoever seeks his own life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. She loses her husband. As time goes on, she loses her two sons. Which means she loses the family name, which means she'll lose her inheritance. There's now a danger of that whole family allotment of land being lost. All the males are gone. She has nothing left. And this is what I'd like to say right about now. Whatever you're going through as a Christian right now, know this. The very worst that God may have for you is better than the very best the devil has for you. You might think you know better and this is extenuating circumstances. So you make wrong choices that are not spiritual, not biblical, not godly. It's better to take the worst that God has for you than the best that Satan has for you. But now, we will watch and we will see that not does God only rule in human affairs, but he overrules in human affairs. Verse 6, And she arose with her daughters in law that she might return from the country of Moab. Watch this. For she had heard in the country of Moab that God had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore, she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Now this is fascinating. God is now on Naomi's mind. Verses 1 through 5, God is not mentioned at all. Because it's the story of a family's life apart from God. But suddenly in verse 6, verse 8, verse 9, and verse 13, God is mentioned. She's God conscious one more time. And she even uses the term Yahweh, the covenant name of God. Now, now this is how I take it. If suffering leads you to God... If suffering leads you to God consciousness, is it bad? We say all suffering must be bad. I don't think so. If my suffering leads me to God and God consciousness and God dependence, I would say that that's good, not bad. David even said in one of the Psalms, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I seek your law or your word. If suffering leads you to God, then learn to embrace it and thank God even for it. Well, here we come to one of the most decisive moments in the book. For that matter, I'm going to make a statement now. One of the most important and decisive moments in all of history. That's quite a statement. If you at that time were able to look at different parts of the world, you would find some monumental things happening at this very moment. At this time in history, the new era of Greece was just beginning over in the Greco-Macedonian region. Over in China, the great Zhou dynasty was in full swing. Over in Central and South America, the Mayan dynasty was growing and very strong. All monumental historical events. Now, with that in mind, who cares about a few women in Moab having a conversation on a road? Well... I just said it was one of the most decisive moments in history. And here's why. Because one day, Jesus Christ will be born in Bethlehem. And he'll be born in Bethlehem because it's the city of David. And David was born in Bethlehem because of his father Jesse and grandfather Obed, who is the son of Ruth. And the reason he's the son of Ruth is because she's going to marry a guy in Bethlehem named Boaz. If this decision isn't made just right, tell the Magi not to come to Bethlehem. No reason for him to come. No Savior will be born. No redemptive history will take place. This is a very crucial crossroads in redemptive history. And I love that 
little verse tucked away in Zechariah 4. Don't despise the days of small beginnings. Here's a small beginning. Verse 11, Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that may be your husbands? So, daughter number one at this point goes back home to Moab. She's not going to hang around. Mom-in-law said, I'm releasing you. I'm going back to my home. You stay here in Moab in your home. So Orpah goes, bye-bye. And she walks off. Verse 16, but Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more, if anything but death parts you and me. Boy, talk about a commitment. This is a steadfast commitment. She says, you know, don't entreat me not to leave you. Please don't bring it up again for me to go back home. I'm not going back home. I'm burning my bridges. I'm I'm going with you. No return ticket. I'm sold out. I'm committed. And it's a huge commitment to leave everything you were familiar with and go to a new place, a new people, a new culture, a new language, and a new God. Boy, I wish Christians were this committed. Some people say, well, I'm very involved. That's great. Now be very committed. There's a big difference, you know. A cow is involved. A pig is committed. A cow gives milk. A pig gives himself. She's committed. I'm giving myself, not only to you, not only to this new relationship, but to the God of Israel. It was a spiritual commitment. Your God shall be my God. So they arrive back in Bethlehem, verse 20. But she said to them, Naomi speaking, do not call me pleasant, Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitter, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full. The Lord has brought me back home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now that's put in there by the Holy Spirit for a very important reason, which we'll understand in a moment. At the time of the barley harvest, it's about mid to late April when they show up in Bethlehem. So that's love's resolve, chapter one. Ruth clings to Naomi. Now we come to chapter two, which is love's response. It's a romantic scene. It's the first time Boaz and Ruth meet together. Do you remember when you first met your wife or husband? Do you remember those, that night, that day? In fact, if you don't, because I only saw about two and a half hands. Okay, a few more. (laughs) Okay, okay, still not enough, okay? Unless the rest of you are single. Try to get, and if you are single, then you, you ought to meet each other afterwards and we'll solve that problem. No, I'm just kidding. Listen. Try to get in touch with what you remember when you first met your spouse. I think it's healthy to do that. And it's healthy to go back and and remember the first love relationship, how the relationship started, how it got kindled, how it developed. I've met a lot of people say, yeah, yeah, I definitely remember when I met him and uh, he's not what I thought he would be. So I really want to remember that. Somebody once said, good advice for marriage is to keep your eyes wide open before you enter marriage and half shut thereafter. (laughs) Well, there was a relative, verse 1, of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. So we understand now that Naomi was once a part of a very aristocratic Bethlehem family. They owned a lot of land. And this is a near relative, a kinsman, a goel is the Hebrew term, a kinsman redeemer. So Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, 
Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. And she said, Go, my daughter. Now, there was a law in the Old Testament, the law of gleaning. Where, here, here's the law. You own land. At harvest time, you go through and harvest, but you leave a lot of it left. You don't go a second time. You leave the corners full of produce so that the poor, the fatherless, the widow, the stranger can go cull through the fields and get whatever is left. It was a way of taking care of the poor. It was the ancient welfare system. And it's interesting, it wasn't just given to them. They had to go out into the fields and work for it. They had to glean it. They had to work. So it built dignity into it. That's what's happening here. Verse 3, then she left, went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now, behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. And then in verse 5, he says, Well, whose woman is this? Now, this doesn't sound like the work crews I've had experience with. He's a spiritual man. Gals, marry a spiritual man. If you're going to find somebody to marry, number one on the list, he loves Jesus Christ. He's a spiritual man because that man, if he becomes your husband, is going to be, in a sense, like Jesus Christ to you. He's in that very important relationship of love and submission. So you want to look for someone who's going to be like Christ to you. That doesn't mean you look for somebody necessarily with long hair and a robe, sandals, and a staff. <laughs> there he is. But someone who's very Christ-like. Because the Bible says, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers or mismated, as the Revised Standard Version puts it. Look for a spiritual man. Notice something back in verse 2 and then in verse 7. Ruth said to Naomi, please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose side I may found, find favor. Verse 7, she says to Boaz, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. Go down to verse 10. So she fell on her face, ouch, bowed down to the ground and said to him, this is a respect, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Do you hear the graciousness in her voice to her mother-in-law, to Boaz, who owns the field, twice? There's an, there's an air of grace. Please, mother-in-law, would you let me go to the field, sweat it out, and work hard all day? Please. <laughs> what if your kids had that attitude? <laughs> Mom, Dad, please, can I clean my room up? And then afterwards, can I please wash your cars? And can I please vacuum? You'd have therapy for six months if that happened. <laughs> but this is what it shows me as I read through it. The trials of her past have not crushed her spirit. She lost her father-in-law. She lost her husband. She took a long journey. She's now in a land where she is under the laws of poverty, having to glean out in the field. And still, she has a grace about her, even though she's suffered immensely and lost considerably. She has grace. Now compare her to John chapter 5, the woman at the well of Samaria who had five husbands, and she was a crusty old character. The way she answered Jesus Christ in those terse little comments, weathered with mistrust. Do you know what? A woman's attitude makes her beautiful or ugly. It's not about the face. It's not about the body. It's really more important about the attitude. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 3, it's not the fancy hair, gold jewelry, or fine clothes that should make you beautiful. No, your beauty should come from within you, the beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit that will never be destroyed and is very precious to God. This girl was beautiful, especially because of this attitude. Verse 11, Boaz answered and said to her, 
It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, and how you have left your father and mother in the land of your birth, and have come to a people with whom you do not know. Again, kindness, sensitivity to Ruth. The relationship, though it's in its nascent stage, is off to a great start. In fact, relationships that don't have kindness, respect, and sensitivity aren't built on a good foundation. If you want to succeed in a relationship, make sure that you have kindness, respect, gratitude, this kind of attitude. It's like the old English proverb, you're going to catch a lot more flies with honey than you will with vinegar. So they're sweet to each other. Verse 12, the Lord, he says, repay your work and a full reward be given to you by Yahweh, the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Boaz knew that she was a godly woman. Boaz knew that she made a conversion experience. She left her gods, Chemosh, on the other side of the Jordan, and now she is following Yahweh, the God of Israel. He remembers, he heard about the decision she made to Naomi. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. And he's remarking on that. Proverbs 31 says, Beauty is vain or passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. It's an unfortunate truth, but in our culture, the one crowning value in our culture is beauty, outward physical beauty. Look at any magazine rack and I rest my case. That's the value, people. Oh, I wish I had that body. I wish I... Hey, nothing wrong with looking good, male or female, you know. Any barn looks better painted. That's just a fact <laughs> for all of us. And we all fight things like age, etc. But the most important crowning value in Scripture, is not the outward, is not the physical. But once again, it's the inward. Verse 15, when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young man, saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. And let grain from the bundles fall purposely for her and leave it that she may glean. Do not rebuke her. So Naomi after this experience, goes home, excuse me, Ruth goes home, tells her mother-in-law, Naomi. Naomi's all excited, encourages her in this process. Verse 20, then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. So she gleans, she brings the stuff home. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, blessed be he of the Lord, verse 20, who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, this man is a relation of ours, one of our close relatives. Now you can just see her. She's the little matchmaker going, this is really good. You want to know this guy. This could be the Lord. You know, I love this because she's not saying, I would never look at another man. Nobody can be the husband that my son was to you. None of that stuff. She's fully, totally engaged in this process. Now, there's an undercurrent in this book before we jump into chapter 3 and then finish up chapter 4. There's an undercurrent that is perhaps the central undercurrent of the book of Ruth. It is the providence of God. This is what I mean. The providence of God, providence, is where God takes ordinary events, ordinary events in life, and arranges them for an extraordinary result. Ordinary events for an extraordinary result. Result. That's called providence. God providentially moves the pieces on the chessboard. Now, providence is very different from the miraculous. I think we use the term miracle way too often, and we depreciate the real meaning of the word miracle. A miracle is where God intervenes or overrides natural law. That's a miracle. For a man to stand upright and walk on water, that's a miracle. Because the laws of nature being as they are, water can never 
displace the weight of an upright human being. For that to happen, it's a miracle. It's the intervention and overriding of natural law. A resurrection from the dead, that's a miracle. Doesn't happen every day. Dead people, once dead, don't get back up. So for that to happen, it's the intervention and overriding of natural law. That's one thing. The providence of God is really cool. By the way, providence is a Latin word originally. Two words, pro video, to see in advance. Pro, before, video or video, to see. God sees your life in advance and he's got the video. And he splices it and changes it and arranges natural circumstances for a supernatural result. A couple of things to notice the providence of God so far. Timing. Timing. Naomi and Ruth show up in Bethlehem at a very particular time. Chapter 1, verse 22. It was the beginning of the barley harvest. That's when God's laws for caring for the poor would be in place at this time. That means at this time, mid to late April, you would have professional farmers and poor gleaners in the fields together. So you'd have Ruth and Boaz in the field together. The timing is providential. Second thing that's providential is the place. It says, in the fields of Boaz. Listen, in Bethlehem, there were lots of grain fields. Not just one, not, but several. Dozens, at least, if not more. You see, the word Bethlehem comes from two Hebrew words. Bet, which is house or place, and lechem, which is bread. And yes, it's pronounced lechem. <laughs> Bet lechem, the house of bread, the place of bread. Bethlehem was the breadbasket of ancient Israel. It's where people grew their grain. So it wasn't just any field. It was a special field in this breadbasket of Israel. Verse, cha chapter 2, verse 3. She happened to come to a part of the field belonging to Boaz. Now we come to chapter 3. And in chapter 3, I feel like singing, Matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. Remember that song? It's an old movie. Naomi is planning... She's the matchmaker, but really, it's a match made in heaven. God is behind the scenes working this whole thing out. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it may be well with you? So you can see her leading up to this. Now, Boaz, whose young women you were with, is he not our relative? In fact, he's winnowing barley tonight in the threshing floor. That means they'd toss it up in the air, and the Mediterranean breezes would separate the chaff from the wheat in the late afternoon. Therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself. Put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. Now, the threshing floors were elevated, and um, it was usually bedrock and the grain was placed on a pile on the threshing floor. It shall be when he lies down, you shall notice the place where he lies. You shall go in, uncover his feet, lie down, and he will tell you what you should do. Now, before we finish this out, Naomi's very practical. Sweetheart, wash yourself, put on your best dress, perfume yourself, Look like a knockout. Look beautiful. Make yourself appealing. And then go in and pop the question to him. Don't let this guy get away. It's exactly what happens. So she agrees. Uh, Boaz lays down at night in the threshing floor. Ruth comes in, uncovers his feet. He wakes up. It's a weird thing to happen. It's cold. Verse 9, then he said, who are you? So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. You know what she's doing here? She's proposing to him. It's a Sadie Hawkins thing. <laughs> she's saying, you're a relative. We lost land. I'm available. Will you marry me? 
And I won't get into it much now because of time, but write down in the margin of your Bible, if you feel the freedom to do that, Deuteronomy chapter 25, and look up the law of the leveret marriage, which says, if a couple gets married and the husband dies and leaves the wife childless, that she will go to his brother or a near relative for him to raise up seed so that his family won't disappear in Israel. It's an odd law, but it's in Leviticus 25, verse 10. Then he said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, and that you did not go after young men, whether rich or poor. What does he mean? Well, Boaz is probably about 45 or 50 years old at the time. Remember, he's a contemporary of Naomi and Elimelech. And she's a young lady. And he says, you know, you didn't go chasing young men, but you waited and went through the law of Israel's procedures. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request, for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Now, it is true that I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Stay this night, and in the morning... It shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you as the Lord lives. So lie down until morning, etc. Now there's no moral or immoral overtones here. This is a very common custom in the Middle East. He's there at the threshing floor. She proposes. He would place his garment or some clothing over her saying, I will protect you. I will take you as my wife if this all works out. So it's a symbolic of his intent. There was no sexual relationship that night. They were in separate places. She was a virtuous woman. He was a virtuous man. And they're both content to wait to see if the Lord's in this. Which takes us now to chapter 4. This is love's reward. Boaz went up to the gate and he sat down there. And behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. Boaz said, come aside, friend, sit down here. So he came and sat down. No, it's a courtroom scene, basically. The gate of a city was a large enclosure. It's where all the judges, the elders sat, all the business was taken care of. And he took ten men of the elders of the city, and he said, sit down here. So they sat down. And he said to the close relative, Naomi who has come back from the country of Moab, sold a piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. If you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is one, no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, this other guy, I will redeem it. Now, in ancient times, if a Jewish family lost their property, it could be bought back at the appropriate time. There was a redemption clause in it. Let me just quickly paint the picture. If a land transaction happened, there were two deeds that were drawn up. Title deeds. Two scrolls. And on the inside were stipulations. If the land is lost, the person who wants to redeem it has to meet these qualifications. He has to be a relative. He has to be able, that is, pay the price, whatever price is stipulated. And he has to be willing. The seal was rolled up in a scroll, and it was sealed. So it couldn't be opened. One was kept in a safe place. The other was kept by the seller. So the buyer had access, the seller had access. Verse 5, Boaz said, On the day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. Now notice how slick Boaz is. At first he doesn't even mention it. Hey, there's a land deal coming. Oh, well, I think I want to buy it. Oh, well, there is a little clause that says if you buy it, you also have to marry the chick. She's a Gentile, by the way, so you have to marry her as well. And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself. I cannot redeem it. In other words, look, I'm married. I have children. 
I'd love to buy the land and acquire more and bring it back into the family, but if it means buying her or having her as a wife, I can't do that. I, I'm spoken for. Verse 9, And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's, all that was Kilion's and Malon's, you know, sicko and crybabies, from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead throughout his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Have you ever seen a person, and in observing the person, you go, you know, that person reminds me of somebody else. When I read about Boaz, that's exactly what I think. When I read about Boaz, I think, he reminds me a lot of Jesus Christ. In fact, one of the clearest pictures of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament is Boaz, a bridegroom who's very tender. And listen to this. He buys a field to get a bride. He buys a field to get a bride. He wants the bride, but he has to buy the field. He buys a field to get a Gentile bride, like the church. And so Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for the joy over it, he sells all that he has and buys the field. That's not a picture of us selling everything to get Christ. You don't have anything worth value to get Christ, nor can you buy him. It's a picture of Christ selling all, giving all, to buy the world, the field, that he might have the bride, us. Now I'm going to close with this thought. In Revelation chapter 5, we have a similar circumstance. John said, And I look, and behold, the one who sat on the throne had in his right hand a scroll that was sealed with seven seals. And it was written inside and on the back. And there was no one found worthy in heaven or on earth or under the earth to take the scroll and unloose the seals. And the angel said, Who is worthy to take the scroll? And no one was found. John said, I wept like a baby. I became Kilion. I started weeping convulsively because no one could redeem it. What's going on here? Same thing, but higher stakes. It's a land deal, but the land in question in Revelation chapter 5 is the whole earth. Revelation chapter 5 is the title deed to the entire earth that is at stake. And Jesus Christ is the one in that chapter who takes the scroll and unlooses the seals because he meets all of the qualifications. He's a near relative, number one. By the way, that's the purpose for the incarnation. He became a human being, a blood relative. He became one of us. So Jesus Christ is related to the human race. So he's related. He's a relative. Qualification number two, he was able to pay the price. Boaz was very wealthy. He could easily afford buying this land. Jesus Christ bought it with his own blood. And number three, Jesus was willing like Boaz was willing. He was willing. Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself. I have the power both to lay it down and to take it up again. Jesus willingly went to the cross. So here's how it worked. God created the earth. Adam was the Benedict Arnold that forfeited the land by his disobedience to Satan. What Romans chapter 5 says, By one man sin entered the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men. That's Adam. He lost the land. Jesus Christ is the second Adam, the only one worthy to take the scroll and perform the right as kinsman redeemer. 